This is a lecture on the politics of international competitiveness delivered October 13, 2000, 2013 at the Emeriti House in Bloomington, Indiana and the Indiana University. My name is Jeffrey Hart. Uh, here's my contact information if you'd like to, to uh, get in touch with me and uh, my web address. I've written three books that are on this topic. Uh, the first was Rival Capitalists, which was published in 1992. Uh, in, 19, in 2002, I, I uh, was co-author of a book called Managing New Industry Creation about the flat panel display industry. And in 2004, I published Technology, Television, and Competition about uh, digital television and HDTV. Um, the uh, concept of international competitiveness is contested to some degree. Um, some people mean different things by it. Economists tend to argue that the only meaningful way to talk about national competitiveness is in terms of changes in productivity. Industry analysts, in contrast, tend to look at other kinds of data, such as profitability and market shares, uh, including production and uh, revenue shares. And uh, they look at frequency of industrial crises and the ability of various industries to create high value added employment. Uh, the World Economic Forum definition is consistent with the usual definition in economics. Uh, to quote from the World Global Competitiveness Report of 2013, we define competitiveness as the set of institutions, policies, and factors that determine the level of productivity of a country. This uh, shows how the global competitive index is computed um, using various kinds of weights on three basic sets of factors, uh, basic requirements, efficiency enhancers, and innovation and sophistication factors. Um, the, these are keys for three different types of economies, the so-called factor-driven economies, the efficiency-driven economies, and the innovation-driven economies. <clears throat> The top 12 in terms of the GCI index are listed in this chart. Uh, Switzerland is at the top, then followed by Singapore, Finland, Germany, the United States, which is number five, Sweden, Hong Kong, Netherlands, Japan, the UK, Norway, and Taiwan. Uh, the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report uh, treats the United States in this following chart. Uh, as an inno innovation-driven economy, uh, and the the blue lines represent what the uh, where the U.S. scores on various measures. Uh, you can see that on market size, it's considerably bigger than most the average markets in this category. Uh, there's more innovation, more business sophistication, more financial market development, more labor market efficiency, and so forth. Um, the U.S. is a little bit lower on higher education uh, than, uh, I'm sorry, a little bit lower on macroeconomic environment than the other economies and slightly lower on institutions, uh, but it's fairly uh, superior on almost all other measures. Uh, according to the World Economic Forum, the most problematic factors for doing business in the United States are its tax regulations, its tax rates, and the inefficient government uh, bureaucracy. <clears throat> so to be uh, critical of that approach, it's basically uh, an economic, fairly conservative notion of competitiveness that in my view undervalues the importance of technology and innovation. So the, the weight for technology and innovation is, is considerably lower than the weight for um, more basic factors. Um, the industry level approaches that I, I believe are less susceptible to these failings, but have the problem of, of being difficult to aggregate to the national level. So uh, it also may be true that that com it's more intelligent to speak about competitiveness in regional terms rather than national terms. So one would expect, for example, that uh, California is a more competitive region of the United States than, say, West Virginia. Uh, an alternative definition of competitiveness comes from Laura DeAndrea Tyson, 
Uh, a nation's competitiveness is the degree to which it can, under free and fair market conditions, produce goods and services that meet the test of international markets while simultaneously expanding the real income of its citizens. So there are two qualifiers in this definition which basically uh, call our attention to the fact that not all market conditions are free and fair. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can stack the deck uh, for or against uh, your, your trade with other countries and um, you can do that in ways that, for example, hurt the real income of your citizens. So if you outlaw unions, you can have low wage rates and thereby com compete for production of low wage goods. Uh, but that comes at the the competitiveness comes at the expense of the income of your citizens. So according to Tyson, that's not real competitiveness. Uh, and in fact, uh, in in recent years, labor costs have been stable or declining in the three major industrialized areas: the Euro area, Japan, and the United States. So whatever. Uh, success they've had in, in, in maintaining or increasing their competitiveness, it has come at the cost of, of uh, uh, income of, of workers. In the 1980s, the main concern in competitiveness was uh, driven by uh, worries about the ability of the United States to compete with Western Europe and Japan and uh, as a result there were a number of of important trade disputes between the US and Europe for example over the Airbus uh, and Boeing uh, competitors in wide-body jets uh, and between the United States and Japan we had a series of trade conflicts over automobiles semiconductors um, steel and, and other industries the uh, U.S.-Japan conflict uh, focused at various points of time in the exchange rate between the, J the U.S. dollar and the Japanese yen with the United States claiming that uh, Japanese yen was overvalued, thereby giving, according to them, an unfair advantage to Japanese exports. If we look at the, uh, at the industry level, at what happened with global production shares, um, you can see that uh, if you look at the uh, uh, the USA figures, um, U.S. share of the glo global production of all three industries was declining over this period, um, whereas the Japanese share was increasing. Um, in, uh, in the case of Europe, there was uh, a decline also but uh, in the case of motor vehicles, actually there was an increase which sort of stabilized out through uh, the end of the 1980s. And uh, Europe was much behind the United States and Japan in, in uh, competition for se semiconductor production. So one of the big things to come out of the research on the 1980s was the rise of Japan and later on the so-called four tigers of Southeast Asia, that's uh, Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea, and Hong Kong. Uh, per capita GDPs in these countries rose very steadily and sharply over this period, uh, even though some high technology industries remained uh, basically in the United States and Western Europe, uh, biotech, aerospace, and pharmaceuticals to be specific. Uh, Asians did not give up comp competing in those areas, and they have made some in, you know, some strides uh, towards becoming more competitive. And one example of that is the flat panel display industry. In uh, in flat panel displays, production shares uh, had this history between 1993 and 2005. So basically, the flat panel display industry, which are basically displays in all laptop computers, and increasingly uh, in TV sets, um, they are based on a technology called thin film transistor liquid crystal displays, TFT LCDs. And uh, even though the, the innovation first occurred in the United States, uh, Japan got way out ahead of everybody uh, with over 90% of pr world production in the early 1990s. Uh, increasingly, however, production shifted to Korea and Taiwan. 
and now it's starting to increase in the People's Republic of China. So um, there's been major shifts in uh, production shares in this area. And so one could infer from that that Taiwan and Korea and now China are becoming globally competitive in this industry. It's interesting because it's a high technology industry and one that they might have had difficulty competing in in previous decades. In the United States, the main problem of competitiveness is currently defined uh, politically in terms of competition with China. So we have the biggest trade deficit with them, and we're worried about the exchange rate with China. In Europe, the relative competitiveness of uh, Europe with China is obviously a concern, but increasingly, especially with the Euro crisis, uh, Europeans are worried about the differential competitiveness within Europe, uh, particularly uh, with uh, with Central Europe and particularly Germany being more competitive vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Southern uh, European countries, uh, Portugal, uh, Italy, Greece, Spain, and, and actually Ireland as well. So uh, the, the Euro crisis is mainly affecting those less competitive countries, so the Europeans are looking very carefully at what could be done to improve the competitiveness of those weaker regions in Europe. Uh, in both both places there's resistance to further liberalization of trade and so that's one of the reasons why we haven't had success in completing the latest uh, trade liberalization or trade multilateral trade round. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between left-wing and right-wing political forces in this area. So people on the right tend to look primarily at price competitiveness without considering issues of productivity and the quality of employment. Uh, and so they tend to focus, in my opinion, too much on, uh, on uh, l lowering wages and reducing uh, regulations. People on the left are more concerned with uh, the wage levels and quality of employment uh, than people on the right, and so they're willing to take a somewhat more a complex view of how to enhance competitiveness uh, and put more stress on technology and other ways of increasing productivity. So, um, so here's another summary of those differences. Uh, in the, on the right, the, the role of the state is supposed to be minimal. On the left, uh, there's a possibility of, of uh, furthering competitiveness through industrial policy. Uh, the right puts more emphasis than the left on the importance of relative labor costs. Um, the right puts more focus on austerity as an answer to uh, the current problems, whereas the left is willing to engage in deficit spending. Uh, the right is very dubious about the ability of this state to pick winners uh, through industrial policy and therefore generally opposes it. Uh, on the left, there's not the same degree of skepticism, and there's a willingness to spend, uh, particularly in the areas of infrastructure, education, and research and development. The right tends to focus on reducing rates of taxation, whereas the left is uh, less concerned with reducing rates and worrying more about uh, providing the necessary services to support innovation. So is it possible for governments to promote the growth and development of high-tech industries? If so, where and when, uh, under what conditions, uh, is some industry promotion unfair and therefore uh, really not legitimate? Um, an example would be the use of subsidies to gain market advantage or the use of uh, diplomacy to uh, promote exports, even though export, exports from your country perhaps may not be as competitive as, as you'd like. Um, there's also the question of uh, political suppression of organized labor to prevent wage increases um, uh, and uh, to artificially deflate wage levels. What is the importance of macroeconomic variables such as the exchange rate that are controlled to some degree by national governments? These are all kind of open questions, uh, that recurring questions that, that are common across from basically from the 1980s on and perhaps even further back than that. So uh, let me talk a little bit about the, the nature of the industrial policies that countries have adopted to, uh, to promote competitiveness and usually of uh, firms that are considered to be national champions. So for example in the United States an aerospace national champion would be Boeing 
uh, or uh, in France, uh, a national champion firm would be uh, Renault, the automobile company. So one of the things you can do is provide subsidies for investment. Uh, you can also engage in public research and development spending. You can create science parks and free trade zones, and you can engage in uh, export incentives to encourage businesses which are not currently exporting to get into the export trade markets. Um, different theoretical approaches support different kinds of policy responses to competitiveness issues. Uh, the neoclassical approach basically is pretty much uh, thoroughly against industrial policies. Um, they are always distorting and therefore uh, take you away from allocative efficiency. The regulatory state approach says, okay, well, we need regulation to make works or markets work properly. Um, and to the extent that industrial policy gets those uh, markets working better, then it's okay. But it, if it goes beyond that, then it's not a good idea. The developmental state approach uh, says uh, industrial policy is useful for catching up uh, with other countries if you're getting behind. And, uh, and the competition state idea is that uh, if you're a regulatory state in, a, in a, an environment where there are a lot of developmental states, then you need to think about that and take it into account. But also, you need to, to rethink your strategies when you're in a globalizing world economy. So these are the four basic approaches, uh, and uh, if, if we think about it, the United States and the UK are, are regulatory states primarily. Um, the uh, Japan and the East Asian Tigers are developmental states. It's quite likely that the People's Republic of China is also a developmental state. Um, and uh, increasingly, all the industrialized countries are looking at moving toward the competitive competition state approach. So to be a little bit more detailed, how would you, if you were looking for empirical uh, observations to distinguish between developmental and regulatory states, you'd have elite bureaucracies in developmental states, uh, transparent and accountable ones in regulatory systems. Uh, you'd have extensive support for new industries in developmental state, uh, limited support in regulatory states, uh, extensive use of state control banks uh, in developmental states, limited use of state control banks in regulatory. And uh, you'd have a tutelary a stance with regard to private firms in developmental states and a more hands-off regulatory approach in regulatory uh, states. Globalization has had an important impact on national economic strategies. Um, basically, everyone uh, has accepted the fact that to remain internationally competitive, firms have to adopt global production strategies. They can't be so focused on what goes on within the, the boundaries of the nation state. Uh, firms that are capable of engaging in foreign investment need to be present in other countries where the rate of growth may be higher. Uh, the, regulatory, the regulatory states have to compete along with other countries, including the developmental states, for inflows of foreign direct investment. Um, so both uh, regulatory states and developmental states cannot succeed with pure national champion strategies. So, uh, giving you the example of General Motors in China, um, after the crisis of 2007-2008, uh, General Motors was bailed out along with, uh, with Chrysler as part of the uh, efforts of the Obama administration to deal with um, the uh, Great Recession. Uh, and one of the things that, that General Motors did right was it moved uh, a lot of its uh, attention to uh, servicing the Chinese market, which was growing much more rapidly than the North American market or the European market. By 2010, uh, General Motors was selling over 2 million vehicles a year, uh, and one of the vehicles that sold very well was the, the Buick model that's shown in that picture below. Uh, their production facilities are, are really excellent, and uh, they look like um, world-class production facilities anywhere. Um, and generally speaking, General Motors is not trying to compete with the, the low-end national champions in China, such as Geely, which makes a car that costs about $5,000, but is obviously of lower quality um, than uh, the General Motors products. 
So globalization in motor vehicles, uh, the ba basic fact is that ma demand has shifted to Asia and particularly to China. Uh, U.S. and European demand is flat. Uh, so growth in de global demand is increasing thanks to higher sales in Asia and developing countries. And companies like GM can remain ahead of other producers only by servicing those markets.